Missed an episode of your favorite podcast? Choose from over a decade of content in our archives. Not just the latest episode. All free at GCNlive.com. This is your call to action. Get prepared, America. Economy, survival, energy, disasters. This is USAprepares.com. Informative radio, educational radio. Interact now by emailing instructor at USAprepares.com or text at 434-390-7953. Class, please take your seats. Now, your instructor, Vincent Finelli. Yeah, I can't do two things at one time. I can't talk and type at the same time. Can you imagine that? Women can do that. Right, Rich Sheevan? Women can, women can do seven things at a time. I can't talk and type at the same time. I hear you. I can't even type on myself. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, Rich, it is great to hear your voice. Um, it really is. Well, thank so you. you've been... You've been stomping around uh, in the woods. You've been probably crawling on your belly. You've been uh, remaining silent, you know, in the weeds, getting ready for winter, right? Absolutely. That's what we do. That's what this lifestyle is all about, living off-grid, being self-sufficient, hunting and fishing and gardening and uh, putting up food for the winter and firewood, and that's uh, that's the lifestyle that we lead. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And... Um, and that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about getting ready for winter, the off-grid style, the off-grid way. And, uh, class, it's not easy. It really isn't easy. Firewood is heavy. My dad used to say that uh, firewood heats twice. Once when you cut it and once when you burn it. <laughs> that's right. And I, I think he was off by maybe... Well, a couple other factors. It heats once when you cut it. It heats another time when you split it. It heats another time when you stack it. It heats another time when you load it in the fire. And it heats another time uh, when it, you burn it. It's, uh, But, you know, I wouldn't trade it. You know, Rich, we have a switch here at the farmhouse. And if we wanted to, we could just, well, actually, it's not even a switch. It's a thermostat well, with a relay. And if we just press a button and we say, let's use um, the heat pump, we could heat our house with a heat pump in the winter. Or if we said, let's hit the next button and we'll use the, uh, the alternative to the heat pump, which is propane, you know, the backup heating system. We could do that. But we haven't used those in years, probably about eight years that we've had the wood outdoor wood furnace. And you heat with wood, we heat with wood. Do, do you see a reason to go back to the tap of the finger on a thermostat or the rotating the dial on a thermostat or sliding the, the slide uh, for the thermostat or um, some other switch to heat with something other than wood? Because I don't. Well, I use 100% exclusivity wood, okay? I'll be honest with you. Um, wood is work. It, it can be heavy. We have a wood splitter, so we don't split with a hand anymore. In fact, last year was the first year I actually hired a logger to drop off a bunch of cords of unsplit, unbucked wood, basically dead mm -hmm. timber, and I just walk up to the pile and cut it now. Um, mm -hmm. For the first 10 years of living here, living this way, I would just harvest my own trees because it took me that long just to harvest the dead trees that were standing. And I harvested a few live ones. But, you know, we're heading into a new industrial revolution, not just with robotics, automation, and artificial intelligence taking millions of jobs. And that's why self-sufficiency is going to be uh, very popular, or plan Bs, plan Cs, whatever you want to call it. But because of the fact that America now is going to probably uh, be the new oil kings, um, I don't see OPEC really, with the price of oil, really uh, going uh, into the dominance that they've had over decades, um, especially because of the petrodollar and their willingness to cooperate with Kissinger and that particular plan. I see with our natural gas, um, 
especially, and oil being so much cheaper. I, I don't see oil with the present value of the dollar going over $60, and if it does, not for very long. And that's going to keep all um, natural resources, like natural gas and propane, down. So I, I, I see energy becoming quite affordable, and um, if people do not want to burn wood, I see uh, things like propane becoming uh, very realistic. Plus, of course, we have electricity and we have, uh, you know, natural gas. Um, there's just so many options out there besides more and more people going on board with solar and off-grid living, as you have recently done. So the options, um, I got, like I, I had lunch with, a, with a, a, f- a couple of friends of mine yesterday, and um Long story short, they're planning on selling this big monstrosity of a house that they're hardly getting any tire kickers to see because most people want to downgrade to small homes and bigger acreage and live more self-sufficiently. So what they're planning on doing is building a pole barn, possibly insulated, putting in an apartment inside so they can drag their boat and their RV and their vehicle inside the pole barn and live that way and possibly live in RV parks during the winter months and travel to Canada and Alaska and do some fishing at lakes and basically have a place where they hang their hat. And they're going to go 100% solar, and he's in his mid-70s, and she's probably uh, early to mid-60s. So people are starting to think outside the box in ways that they never have before because of all the options that we have in energy. And I love wood because um, it. I love the heat you get from it. Plus, we live with a wood cook stove, so we kill multiple birds with one stone. We had a we have a water reservoir attached to the stove, so we get our hot water from it. We also cook on it, and of course, it heats the cabin. So um, you know, we kill as many birds with one stone as we possibly can. And the heat you get from wood is second to none regarding the actual feeling. It goes into your bones. It warms up warms you up in a log cabin it warms up the logs so a couple days of a wood stove just keeps the inside of the cabin warm Thanks. you know rich it what you just said might be a little bit difficult for people who have not experienced that to to believe and i'm here to tell you that what rich said is absolutely true you know but you have class most of you have been near an open fireplace and you sat in front of it, and you, and you feel that warmth. That's the kind of warmth he's talking about that you get. You don't get it quite that much, but you still get that same general feeling to a lesser degree from a wood stove. Now, the farther away you move from it, the less you feel that. But, yes, it, it, it heats you right through your skin to the bones. It's a different kind of a warmth. Uh, Rich, I was, I was uh, thinking about a call I made uh, several weeks ago. And I called a propane company, and I asked them what is the cost of a gallon of propane delivered, and it was about a dollar nineteen per gallon, maybe a dollar twenty nine, something like that. That's relatively inexpensive, you know, because at some we've had shortages of propane, um, manufactured shortages, and propane has gone to about three dollars a gallon, maybe even three dollars and fifty cents a gallon, and some of the dealers. Uh, in our neck of the woods, who have uh, contracted what they call uh, pre-buy. So what you do is you say, all right, the price in the summertime when no one wants too much pro- uh, propane, the price is $1.19 a gallon. I'll take a 1,000 gallons, and you pay them for a 1,000 gallons. And then the idea is in the wintertime when the price goes higher or when the, when the propane companies raise their prices higher because not everybody is willing to, to plan and prepare. Um, the price may go to $1.79, $1.89, $2.19, $2.29, something like that. Well, what happened during this manufactured shortage of a few years ago, the propane dealers who sold those contracts to people who bought 1,000 gallons at a crack decided that they weren't going to honor the contract. And they said, well, I'll tell you what, yeah, I know you. You paid us for a thousand gallons at a dollar nineteen, but you know the price is four forty nine a gallon. So if you want, we can probably in a few days get you a hundred gallons, but you're gonna have to pay us four forty nine a gallon in advance. 
So even though they paid more, uh, I'm sorry, even though they paid for a thousand gallons, and even though they had a thousand gallons on the books and didn't take any of it, they still had to buy their propane in order not to freeze to death. And so that brings to discussion the, uh, the term Max's Law. And Max's Law is buy the best, pay cash, and take delivery. So the people who bought the propane, 1,000 gallons, paid for it. They bought the best. They probably paid cash, but they didn't do the third thing, take delivery. And by not taking delivery, even though they bought it, even though they had a contract, they couldn't get to it. Now, I'm, I'm sure that I probably would negotiate a little differently. I would have shown up. Uh, <laughs> I might have, <laughs> I might have shown up with a diesel truck uh, aimed at the front door, and I might have asked my son to to uh, just sit in the truck and just make sure he stays nice and warm and rev up the engine every few seconds while I was inside discussing how, when we were going to get this delivery. Uh, <laughs> just to make sure that the guy knew that, you know, if his foot slipped or something, that truck might lurch forward and go through the front door. But, you know, I'm sick of people. I'm sick of people not honoring agreements. I really am. Uh, yeah, I am. And, you know, I know what I'm saying is a little a little extreme. And, and I'm probably saying it... Um, not meaning exactly what I'm saying, but the intent would be I'd make sure the guy would know that by not honoring the commitment, the contract um, that that we paid for, that we agreed upon, and us freezing and not having any propane, things probably would get difficult very quickly. That's what I'm saying. And, and that I do mean. Uh, I do mean that. I don't mean that I would uh, go out and take the law into my own hands, but I certainly would let him know that I would do everything I could to make sure his business felt the full benefit of his actions. Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I certainly agree with the fact that um, you have to be firm and be aggressive when it, when it warrants it. However, I believe in uh, the plan A that you were just talking about regarding buying propane during the summer months while it's cheap, having enough to get through the winter and not having to worry about any of that. And taking delivery. And you can do that. You can take delivery. Yep. And Rich bought his wood and took delivery. And we cut our wood and we stacked it. Talking about getting ready for winter, the off-grid way. Hey, Rich, um, yep. are you willing to share about how much wood you use in a winter? Absolutely. I'll talk about firewood, hunting, fishing, trapping, canning, preserving food, gardening, composting. The whole works. Okay. Like, Yeah, let's talk about wood for, for starters. How much wood do you use to heat your cabin per winter? On average, I've been living off-grid in this cabin for almost 11 years. And on average, I use about nine cords of wood, 128 cubic feet. So last year I used quite a bit more because we had a very cold winter. Now, but on average it's about nine cords. So, you know, with me getting a little older and, uh, you know, using moderation and modification as a motto, I do things a little differently. Again, I use a wood splitter to split my wood. Because we have a wood cook stove, we use very few splits. And what a split is, is a basically a buck, which is a short piece of wood, like 18 inches, and you put it, and you split it. And we use the splits to start a fire and save a fire. Or if we want to cook something and it's going too slow and we want the stove to get hotter, that's when we use the split. So we basically use the splits sparingly. So we don't split a lot of wood. Ninety. Five percent of my firewood are bucks, which are big pieces of round wood or rounds about 18 inches long. And that keeps my fire going consistently. I try to use as dry of a wood, as cured wood as possible, so there's less creosote in my um, pipe, so there's less chance on fires, and my insurance company, I'm sure, appreciates that. And... Um, 
I have pretty much all my wood cut going into uh, mid end of November, even though we've been using the wood stoves since middle of September for at least morning fires. Right now we're doing pretty much morning fires. And once we start getting highs into the 40s, that's when we're using the stove most of the day. But even on the coldest days in the winter and the, when the days are shortest, shortest and we're in below zero, which happens to probably, we didn't have many last winter, but we, we probably, uh, but we had consistent cold. Um, we usually have three days to one week of below zero for lows, not for highs. And, um, we'll burn probably maybe to three, four o'clock in the afternoon. And we don't burn too late in the day because it makes it too hot to sleep at night. So, it's all forethought. It's all foresight on how we operate the stove. And, um, again, we talked about this, but the, the wood heat is so much more intense and warmer that you get from electric, from propane, from natural gas, whatever heat source you have that um, is more man-made or synthetic or processed wood heat just has a lot more functionality, especially when you have a wood cook stove that cooks your food, Vince. You know, Rich, as, as you're saying this, um, I, I've got a visualization of your cabin. I've seen some uh, pictures of it. And in your kitchen area, you have this large, we might call it, uh, might call it a large Amish wood cook stove. That is your your cooking stove, and that is your heating system, and that is your hot water heating system as well. Is that correct? That's absolutely correct. Okay. Now, this this was not an inexpensive stove. This stove cost at least ten times as much as you could get a stove for it, one of those big box stores. Let's say you want an electric range. You know, not not bottom of the line, not top of the line electric range, or, or a natural gas range, but kind of somewhere in the middle, okay? Yours would cost 10 times more than that. Is that correct? That's probably correct, but keep in mind that a lot of um, appliances, are, I've been reading about this, not just stoves, but washers, dryers, refrigerators, freezers, their shelf life is a lot more disposable. Mm -hmm. The shelf life right. of the average modern appliance today is probably half of what it was back in the 70s and 80s. So you have to factor that as well. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm not saying, wow, you wasted a lot of money. I'm not saying that at all. What I am saying that is that if our class is thinking about getting a wood stove, and it's a cast iron stove, whether it be a, uh, oh, a Vermont castings type of a, a wood stove, heater type wood stove, or a kitchen stove that's cast iron, it's going to be a lot more expensive than you probably think. But that, but it's a, I still have my grandmother's cook stove here at the house that she had about 100 years ago, literally. We'll be right back. Class, uh, I've got one, two, three, four, five screens in front of me. Five computer screens in front of me. I'm only using three of them right now. And one of them is so that I can uh, look up the latest news and information. Another one is I can look at the statistics regarding this broadcast and the transmission. I can look at how uh, the type of connection, how much... Oh, there you go. right now it looks like I've got uh, a breakup. Uh, looks like there's massive delays and interference. I can look at that. I can look at the modulation, and um, I can look at the delay between uh, our farm and Genesis Communications Network. So, you know, right now it's two seconds. It's a long, long delay. Uh, it's getting better, but something happened to our connection, and uh, I can watch that. Well. I have another screen that shows me uh, the call lines. We have multiple call lines. And when the phone rings, I can see the lights uh, or the color of that particular phone line changing. So think of it like multiple bars on a screen, horizontal bars. And when a call comes in, even before it's answered, the, the color of that particular bar indicating that particular phone line turns a different color. So I was watching the, the call screen, and it changed color. Now, it hadn't been answered yet, and my take on that was that uh, 
Kyle from Montana would be calling in based on just looking at the call screen. But it didn't say Kyle in Montana is calling. It just changed colors. Welcome, Kyle. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, gentlemen. Hi, Rich. Hey, Kyle. How are you? So, so I am doing well. Man, I haven't heard from you in a coon's age, you know. I know. How's, how's the new house? Oh, it's doing well, really, really well. We, uh... We we decided we were going to scale back our uh, our uh, uh, tomato production this year, you know, and it was uh, really funny because uh, we put in about 30 feet last year and we took out 260 pounds of tomatoes. So we decided, well, we'll just cut this back to like 15 feet because, man, we got more salsa than a bear has fur. So anyway... uh we didn't need anything like that, and my wife had already made two or three gallons of ketchup and all that stuff, you know, we're still sitting on, and that's canned up, and so we just put in about 15 feet, maybe 18 feet of tomatoes, and uh, crying out loud, boy, did they explode. Uh, we got over 120 pounds of tomatoes off of that 15 feet uh, in the wow. greenhouse. Just, uh, wow. Wow. Yeah, we were just, we're giving away tomatoes, and, and my wife made more ketchup. And <laughs> you know, you just, you got to do so much with this stuff, and we finally got almost everything put to bed in the garden. How are you doing on that? Oh, yeah, no, we had we had a pretty de- decent year this year, and we had a really good hunting season so far. And, uh, no, life's been good. It really has. And, um, you know, one of the things I want to put in context, Vince and, and Kyle, if I may take a few minutes to put uh, some of the reasoning in context on why we live this way. And, Kyle, you can chime in after I'm done. It's more of a novelty. It's more of a lifestyle. But it really is a hedge against today's uncertainties in life. You know, we live in this politically correct, drunk on political correctness, Kool-Aid uh, country that we live in. And uh, we have a different set of rules, laws, and accountability based on group identity politics and not hard work, effort, poor results, and qualifications anymore, which has lowered the bars and standards and expectations, which has made it very difficult for the average Joe to control their own destiny. So whether you hunt or fish or, or, or glean firewood or can to preserve food and have a garden and compost and do all of these things, there's so many wild cards out there. And you know me, Vince, I love to use economic and financial analogies I mean, look at what's happening here. I do a lot of reading on the Great Depression, and there's four things that really jump out at me. Silver manipulation, increasing interest rates, with which the power was want, wanted to do, and all the silver manipulation that's been going on for years, but, and they're even admitting it and not even getting uh, going to jail. Um, Rothschild Bank in Austria going down. You know, banks are all compromised and held together by, with glue by the central banks right now and a decrease in money supply. We all know they want to get rid of quantitative easing due to the opposite quantitative tightening, which is contractual. And then you got to look at the inflation perspective of it. Now they can press buttons to print money out of thin air with nothing to back it. No free trade, no supply and demand. Uh, savings uh, is almost non-existent. Seventy percent of Americans live day by day. It's about printing money into prosperity, which... Prosperity comes for the bond money, 3% from savings, not from printing money, because the printing money all goes to the super wealthy. So you print lots of money, debt is out of control, credit is out of control, you sell treasury bonds, you lose the world reserve currency, which is hanging by a thread, loss of fiat uh, dollar, consumer confidence, a surge in dollars abroad coming home all at once because China and, and Russia and the BRICS nations and all nations don't even want to use the petrol dollar as the world reserve currency anymore for oil or any other trade. There's so much uncertainty out there, folks. Everything from the deflationary spiral that we're in now to the inflation or hyperinflation that could occur shortly because of these behaviors. So living this way, living off grid, learning skill sets, being in control of your own destiny, especially organic food. I mean, so many people don't even take enzymes. And that's one of the reasons why we eat a lot of raw food, because they, enzymes act as catalysts for biochemical reactions, which aids in digestion and nutrient support. And if you cook your food over 130 degrees Fahrenheit, which most people do, especially during the winter months, you're not getting those enzymes for those benefits. So whether it be health, financial, economic, just being a thinker in lieu of a follower, living off-grid, being self-sufficient, 
in as many ways as you can is a huge benefit. Kyle? Oh, I totally agree with you. You know, it's a, it, it really is. Uh, I feel like many times, and I'm sure you do too, you know, when you're talking to your friends or a lot of different people, of course, we, we do live in a lot, you and I up here in this neck of the woods, we deal with a lot of people that are pretty self-sufficient, you know, minded type people, but they're really not doing anything other than hunting and fishing to provide for their their own, you know, food. I don't know about you, but uh, I, I was talking to a guy just the other day, and I was saying, you know, well, we we shoot our elk or deer or whatever it is, you know, and then we process it ourselves, and we cut it up, and, and we grind our own hamburger and, and all this, and, and he says, well, mine's not very cost efficient, he said, because I take it in and have it done. Well, what in the world are you doing that for, you know? If you don't, I mean, because sure, you might not know how, but there's books on it, and even if you do it wrong, I mean, good grief, how wrong can it get? You know, a steak is a steak. Uh, so I was just trying to convince him to, to give it a whirl. But, you know, just uh, it, 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 it amazes me how little uh, people can do for themselves anymore. Uh, it's, all, it, it's, it's extremely scary. Uh, my son is a foreman for a construction company down in Bozeman, and and uh, he says, Dad, man, I'm so tired of these guys that that show up and don't know the first thing about how to put in a day's work or will schedule their tires uh, to be changed or something like that during the day uh, when it's time to work. You know, he says, figure you got to figure out a way around this kind of stuff. He's, he's explaining common sense to them. And he's only 23, and these guys are, are 35, 38, 40 years old. He said, I'm just really tired of it. He said, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm getting to the point where I'm fixing to become the mean boss. <laughs> but, you know, it's just, it's, it's sad to me just to watch our country, uh, go down the toilet, uh, in reality because there's so many people that just don't have a clue about how to take care of themselves in any way, shape, or form. Well, you know, you look at the, the headwinds for future growth, and I touch on this at almost every show I'm on. Demographics, debt, credit, pensions, valuations. I, I, I think a lot of people are losing it and giving up, and that's why our future looks bleak. I mean, you look at even more, most corporations now are in the looting stage of uh, of America, you know, they're protected by big government, mainstream media, and the, and the courts and the, and the attorneys. They've eliminated core business models. You know, they say their credit rating's good, but it's mostly junk status. You look at CEOs and CFOs around the country with big organizations and corporations, they're using 0% loans to buy back stock. They give themselves huge bonuses, pay the cut, um, their people dividends, which some companies, like even the ExxonMobil, had to borrow money to pay dividends. Everybody's hanging by a thread. There's no reinvestment in the company or in the people or in innovation with products and new services. So everything looks good on paper, but when they issue bonds, they're basically selling debt and they're bundling bad debt or toxic assets with AAA government bonds to sell to the public, especially desperate pension funds that are looking for yields. And all earnings are adjusted. And this is the the protectionist system that we have by our fascist system. Even the SEC protects the the fraudsters. So... When you look at what's coming about our country and the fascist system that we have, it's pretty obvious that the super wealthy are being protected, like Bezos from Amazon gets a dollar forty-eight from taxpayers from each box shipped. Nestle, I talk about this all the time. In California, they issued, they got a five hundred dollar permit and stole twenty-seven million gallons of water from California. I mean, and, and yet the people in California can't even drill wells to to, to uh, protect their own farms. People need to realize that fascism, the definition, post-2009 has changed in the dictionaries and on and in the computer databases. Okay, Today they're saying it's a right-wing ideology or movement that's fundamentally opposed to democracy and liberalism. What What the definition is, is a system of government marked a totalitarian by a totalitarian dictatorship for social and economic control and suppression by the opposition, by system. Okay, and this is why, so when it's basically 
a alliance, an alliance of big corporate oligarchies with big government protected by the mainstream media and the court system. And that's why the small and medium-sized businesses cannot compete. That's why the, they, the powers that be want the high regulations, high minimum wage. Um, they, they, they want to make it so there's no competition, and it's just the big corporate oligarchies running the show. And this is so, why it's so important to be self-sufficient, to learn the skill sets for us as individuals so we can survive. Vince? We'll be right back. We've got... Rich Sheban, OffGridMontana.com. Kyle is in Montana. Rich Sheban's with us, OffGridMontana.com. Kyle. Kyle Harris is with us. Kyle lives in Montana as well. Both USA Preparedness instructors. I have a couple comments, guys, on what you were just saying during the last segment. Mrs. Finelli has a friend who lives in the big city. The big city. Not a big city, but the big city. And uh, they spent some time together recently. And uh, Mrs. Finelli's friend said, so, so Vinny's got this radio show. What do they talk about? And she was explaining that preparedness and survival and things like that. And uh, so her friend didn't seem to think that that was as important as Mrs. Finelli thought. And it was kind of surprising. So... Mrs. Finelli said, well, uh, like this, uh, let's say there is a power grid down situation. The power just stops. And there can be a lot of reasons. So she didn't get into all the reasons why. And, but she said, so the grid, the grid goes down, and, and that affects commerce. Uh, you won't be able to buy things at the cash register. The stores won't be able to order because if the grid is down, the Internet's down. And manufacturing will be down. So it, it's a big problem. And her friend said, well, you know, the strong will survive. Well, that's true. That's absolutely 100% true. Not all, all the strong will survive, but, you know, some. Some will probably survive. And then uh, the discussion went on, and, and she said, Mrs. Finale said, have you thought about, you know, having food? And she said, well, I know how to plant a garden. I can always plant a garden. But I don't think what went into the discussion was, how long it takes from the minute you think about planting the garden until you have tomatoes or lettuce <laughs> or cucumbers. Okay? Yep. And And that uh, presupposes that you've got the seeds in your pocket, right? I mean, really. So uh, Mrs. Finelli was kind of scratching her head, you know, and after a few iterations of trying to explain some of this, she gave up. She decided that it wasn't worth the fight. That was like next, you know, because this this woman was saying, and this is this is not an unintelligent woman. This this woman is very intelligent, but this woman is a consumer, lives on the supply chain in the big city, and trucks and trains, you know, bring provisions into the city all day long, every day. But they live on the supply chain, and it was. It, it was frustrating for Mrs. Finelli because this woman said, look, if, if we're hungry, we'll just find some plants to eat. Now, i got to tell you, in the big cities, I think the only plants that you might find are little blades of grass that grow up in the cracks of concrete. I mean, <laughs> am I confused? <laughs> you know, I, I was just thinking about something, as a matter of fact, uh, during the break, that goes right along with this. And living like Rich does and I do and you do, it causes us to think so uh, ahead a whole season, almost always. Where if we're in pretty much we in in here in Montana, we have summer and winter. Uh, I mean, there ain't a whole. This last year was not much of a change, uh, time change between uh, uh, cold and we went right into some. You know, flip the switch and turn the heat on. Uh, outside, but we have to, we plant early in the spring, you know, uh, lots of plants that are in our little, uh, guest room thing where we start all of our plants and all of these things. Same thing is true, like if you're going garage sailing. This last summer, uh, I needed a, a gas powered snowblower 
for uh, because I don't want to shovel any more of the snow that I have to push off of my greenhouse. I had four or five feet of snow on either side of the greenhouse, and I wanted to pick up a little uh, uh, self-propelled uh, uh, snowblower. And I got one at a garage sale that looked like it rolled off the showroom floor for $40. Wow. But, yeah, Tell you what, yeah, Kyle, do you have yeah. a few more minutes? Do you want to stay with us? Sure. Yeah, I'll stay on. Sure, okay. Great, great. Uh, the last snowblower that I bought was probably 20 years ago. It was just like yours, I guess, except it was a pretty big one. It was maybe 8 horsepower, something like that. And I paid maybe $150 for it. And it was awesome. It was a, you know, could do a driveway in, in no time. And I, but, uh, don't have that anymore. We just use our uh, our tractors to push the snow. We'll be right back. Rich is with us. Rich Sheevan, Off Grid Montana. Everyone all set? Cocked, locked, hour number two of USA Prepares. Rich Sheevan's with us. Off Grid Montana. He wrote the book, One New York Man's Journey to Off Grid Living in Montana. And Kyle Harris is with us. USA Preparers Instructor. He lives in Montana as well. Both have plenty of experience in off-grid living. And I was talking about a friend of Mrs. Finelli's uh, during the first hour broadcast today about how not everybody fully understands the ramifications should the grid go down. And... Uh, um, the lady that uh, my wife was with was saying that we'll just find some plants to eat. It's not a big deal, and we'll grow a garden. Everything's going to be fine. And Mrs. Finelli said things like, well, do you think that, you know, you may be uh, getting visitors who want to take what you have? Do you think that people might show up if they think that you've got some food? And uh, the response was, well, the strong will survive. So we're not going to be able to get our message to everyone, and I guess that's that's the point. And after years and years and years of frustration, I've come to the point well, where um, just kind of like what Mrs. Finelli did, and she just decided that, you know, it's not worth a fight. Um, so this person has her opinions, and uh, let's move on to the next topic. So that was uh, just a wrap-up of what we are talking about during the first hour. Kyle said that uh, you got for $40 a snowblower. So I went shopping on the Internet, Kyle, and I found some snowblowers, okay? A brand-new snowblower, a 28-inch with a small engine, $1,200. Uh, that would be the considered the good quality. If you wanted a little better quality, you could get an Aaron's with, um, uh, yeah, an Aaron's model, which is still $1,200, but if you wanted to get what they called their best, you could get a different Aaron's model, a 30-inch, for $1,800. So then I went to Craigslist, and I looked, okay, so what could I buy one for on Craigslist? A little tiny two-cycle snowblower used $150, and you got yours for $40. Yeah, and it uh, it actually was the 30-inch Aaron's. Wow! <laughs> yeah. So, uh, and uh, it had uh, it even had the guy had chains uh, for it, the little tiny chains that go on it. But uh, I needed yeah. a thirty inch because I've got three feet between the side of my greenhouse and my six foot high fence that goes all the way around the garden, and then I have about four feet on the other side of the greenhouse between it and the, my raised beds. So. Uh, this is going to work out perfect, you know. Uh, it's so, just, I couldn't believe it. Kyle, let me see if I've got this right. So if you multiply $40 times 45, meaning if you spent 45 times as much, 45 times as much, you would get $1,800, which is the price of a new one. And yours was almost new. Oh, if literally a guy, uh, my neighbor's side, and he couldn't believe it. Uh, and I asked the guy even, I said, uh, well, why, uh, man, uh, this thing looks like brand new. And he said, well, uh, I've, I've had it for about five years, but he said I've only used it three times because uh, my neighbor comes down here with a four-wheeler and most of the time plows me out. 
And so I said, uh, why are you selling it? Because he said, well, my neighbor did it all year last year, so I don't think I need it anymore. And I asked him how much, and he said 40 bucks, and I couldn't get the money out of my pocket quick enough, you know. But yeah. the, the, the thought process that I wanted to bring out here, Vince, is that, you know, you and I and, and Rich, uh, we, I mean, I don't know about how you guys do things, but when I'm hitting garage sales and stuff in the summertime, I'm looking for stuff for the winter. I'm looking yeah. for good, heavy leather gloves. Uh, I'm looking for leather boots, uh, stuff that's mm-hmm. going to last that, that I see that, you know, it, uh, that would cost me a fortune. I bought a mm-hmm. set of leather boots. For five dollars, and their Hawthorne leather boots were five bucks. Uh, the loggers that look seriously, they look like new. Uh, you know, I just can't believe what people, uh, they just, we have such a throwaway society, and yeah. we just don't think down the, we don't think, the people not only do not think about uh, the possibility of an economic collapse or, or the grid going down or anything like that. We've lost in this society the ability to think about the changing seasons and how to prepare for just that. Absolutely correct. Um, as, as you were, as you were saying this, I was thinking, how much would a pair of shoelaces cost or bootlaces? I'll bet a pair of new bootlaces would cost more than you paid for the boots with the laces. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Well, I, I think I think it's wonderful that uh, that you go garage selling. Now, I can't go garage selling here where I live because there are very few items that I would be interested in. People just don't have them. People don't prepare the way Rich Sheban does, the way you do, and the way I do. So I have to find other sources for the, the things that I would like to buy. I wish I could go garage selling. I happened to be going down the road one day on the way back from uh, Springfield, and there was a guy that had a couple things out uh, in, his, in his driveway, and he was selling them. <clears throat> and uh, one of the things that caught my eye was a, a contractor's wheelbarrow. Now, a good one's easily a hundred dollars, and this guy had one of those with the, you know a real tire made in the United States kind of thing, and it was probably from the nineteen sixties nineteen seventies It was really heavy, really good, and it was i don't know maybe fifteen dollars. but the point was it was one that would last another forty years if he kept it out of the rain. Well, the problem was I couldn't get it in the car. I happened to be driving a car normally, I drive a truck and I just throw it in the back, but he did have a couple jack stands, and they were $5 a piece. I said, okay, um, may I buy those? And he said, sure. And then he had some cast iron pots or pans, and about four of them. And they were really grungy. And I said, uh, they were $5 a piece. And I said, may I buy these? And he said, sure. So I bought all those things, put them in the trunk, took the cast iron pots or pans, and put them in the outdoor wood stove, uh, stove for a few days, and they looked brand new. I mean, literally. They look brand new. So, yeah, you can find some really good things. Now, why would anybody sell, I don't know, 60-year-old pot, uh, pants? Why would anybody do that? I, can't, I don't, for $20 for four of them? Does that make any sense? What would he replace nope. them with? You what go would, down here okay. to a second-hand store, they'll cost you 35 bucks a piece. But what, my, my question is, okay, so now he's got $20 in his hands. I've got the, the four pans, the cast-iron pans. What is he going to do with the twenty dollars? How how would he replace what he just sold me with twenty dollars? How would he do it? He couldn't. And what would he get? He would get some cheesy, cheesy Chinese uh, cookware that would never last as long. Never. Yep. Um, I guess it's it's too hard to clean cast iron if you don't know how to do it. It's really easy if you do know how to do it, right? Mm-hmm. You bet. Yeah. Well, I, I'm, I'm aghast at the, the thought processes of many people. This lady, my uh, wife was talking about, she's just going to grow a garden. You know, the, the power goes out now, and she's going to start growing a garden. Kyle, how long does it take you from the minute you think about growing a garden? And I'm going to ask Rich the same question. How long does it take you from the minute you say, Sharon, let's grow a garden? How long does it take you to actually have something you can pick from your garden? Well, we start in about the end of February, 
is when we start in here in our in our little room here, and then we pick uh, the tomatoes and everything usually by about uh, the end of uh, September, uh, somewhere in that area, middle to the end of September. So, you know, you go from the start to the finish. That's what we're talking. I'd say seven months. What is that? About March, April, May, June, July, August, September. About seven months. Hey, that is- Yep. Yes. Rich? And my wife, my wife, my wife just told me said if you wanted to try to live on lettuce and radishes, you could probably get that in about thirty to forty-five days. <laughs> that's still it's still a long time to be hungry. Yeah, it sure is. <laughs> You're kidding? It's hard to fast that long. I know that for yeah. sure. Rich, how long? How long would it take you? Well, it's the same mindset. Um, I let some of my seeds. Some of my vegetables, like spinach, for example, go to seed, and second year carrots go to seed. So I'm picking a little earlier. Carrots, not so much, but I'm picking spinach. Um, I have baby spinach when the snow melts, and I don't pick it for uh, about a month. But uh, you know, I, I also harvest a lot of uh, edible plants as well, and uh, that's always a lot of fun because I give tours on that. But uh, I want to talk about uh, Mrs. Finelli's friend since you brought that up a few times. Since. Okay, sure. Um, First of all, you mentioned shoelaces. Folks go out and buy a roll of parachute cord. Mm-hmm. You will never buy shoelaces for the rest of your life, okay? And mm-hmm. it's way, way higher quality than uh, what you buy for shoelaces in the store. Second of all, you mentioned that she's an intelligent lady. First of all, I noticed that there's two types of intelligence. One's theory and one's practical experience. The yes. people who are book readers and talk and read about theory who live in urban suburban America and don't understand this lifestyle are very often one-dimensional or maybe two-dimensional. When you talk about people who live with practical experience, like Kyle says, we live with foresight, we think a season or a year ahead, and we're multidimensional. But there's so many calamities in life that we can't control our own destiny. They could be financial, economic, social, and political, and not just the EMP that Mrs. Finelli gave as an example. For example, I read an article this morning that a fireman in Detroit lost his job because he brought in a watermelon to work. This is called a society that's drunk on the Kool-Aid's political correctness. We are allowing the elite to poison us against ourselves. So there's so many ways and reasons to lose your job, to lose your career, to lose your livelihood. And if you don't have a plan B, then you're going to suffer. Vince? I'm, I'm stumped. So a fireman brings a watermelon to work and loses his job? Yeah, it was a new day in this uh, firehouse. It was tradition to bring in a gift. Some people bring in donuts. He brought in a watermelon with a ribbon tied around it. It wasn't to be racist or anything. It was just to be, to say thank you to the guys. Well, some guys. um... Well, Rich Sheban, I I found the article. Uh, Actually, there's lots of them. Fox2Detroit.com. It says that earlier this month, a 41-year-old Robert Pattison went to introduce himself to the fellow firefighters at Engine 55 uh, in Detroit, and uh, a, the chief of that uh, Engine 55 says it's a tradition for firefighters to bring a gift. So this guy obviously was a new uh, probationary uh, fireman, and uh, it's not mandatory, it's voluntary, he says, but you come in bearing gifts, and the usual gift is donuts. But you're allowed to bring whatever you want to bring in. You're allowed to bring in a gift that you want. Uh, it sounds to me like, uh, well, they're saying it doesn't matter what it is. So he brought in a watermelon with a pink ribbon or pink bow attached to it. And uh, the article goes on to say we're told that some African-American fighter fighters were instantly offended since 90% of the people who work at Engine 55 are black. Now, that's... Uh, I, I don't get it. Seriously. Uh, I'd love it. I, who who doesn't like watermelon? Is it that black people don't like watermelon or that black people do like watermelon? What about white people? I don't know anyone who doesn't like watermelon. Not a single person. So, that, But I do know people who won't eat donuts because of the sugar. So this guy brings in something that everybody would like and he gets fired for it? Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Well, it- 
And you've heard me say this many times before, Vince. You don't empower a nation or a group by lowering the bars of standards and expectations. When you say your group can't compete, your work is suboptimal, you're degrading, disrespecting, and insulting the work ethic, ability, and intelligence of all these groups by lowering the bars of standards and expectations. It's all meant to make society submissive and break your will. And that's why these politically correct buzzwords have been hijacked by definition. And, um, you know, racist, bigot, sexist, misogynist, homophobe, conspiracy theorist, intolerant, violent, hater, this is what they throw at you when they lower the bars of standards and expectations and you say something against the present system. It's to eliminate ingenuity, productivity, and innovation, and it's to reward mediocrity. And that's why... They're normalizing all these behaviors, and everything is on the chopping block, especially the middle class. And that's why I refer to the middle class as the bottom 93%, because the middle class has melded in with the poor. So if we don't reward or judge by hard work, effort, poor results, and qualifications in lieu of all of this stupid, politically correct Kool-Aid stuff, this is what we get, a nation divided. So when people say divide and conquer, they basically should be saying, lowering the bars of standards and expectations because victim group status or protectionist group status or group identity politics is referred to by the elite as identity politics for the sole purpose of masking and hiding the propaganda and Hegelian dialectic behind the scenes. Vince? Mm -hmm. Kyle, I had a question for you. Uh, have you ever heated with wood? <laughs> Only most of my life. Uh, yep. practically all of my married life. Yeah, I put up, uh, and this year, uh, I was, uh, I had, uh, a knee replaced, and so I ended up for the first time in my entire life buying firewood, uh, mm -hmm. this year. Uh, and, uh, I put up about, I burn about five and a half to six cord a year for heat. Uh, I don't have a wood cook stove, uh, that's hooked up yet. I've got one in my shop that I've got to get. I want to put a little addition on the back side of my house here, and then I'm going to put the wood cook stove in there uh, eventually. But uh, you know that uh, you were talking about the expense of them. Uh, we bought this one uh, that we have that is a gorgeous uh, wood stove, has the water jacket and everything on it, at a garage sale for $450 a few years ago. And I saw another one at a garage sale just this year, um, and I was too late. Somebody had just bought it. But it was even nicer than the one we've got now, and the lady was selling it for two hundred and fifty dollars. But somebody had already mm -hmm. got it, or else I would have bought it just to have, uh, mm -hmm. you know, to put it because it was nicer than the one we have. But you know, things people can do because, uh, like like Rich was saying, you know, my dad had a term for this this lady that you were talking about, and and he called it educated beyond their intelligence. And, uh, we, because the reality is when you have, uh, sometimes when people, uh, you know, like Einstein could barely tie his shoes, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, those kind of people, unfortunately, are going to die. Uh, like my wife said, you know, it's hard to plant a garden with a fork and a knife and a spoon, you know. I guess she's talking about being a consumer and surviving. Is that right? Yep. That's exactly right. When we come back, uh, class, I'm going to tell you how big a cord of wood is. Kyle uses about the same amount that we use. Uh, Rich Sheban uses a little bit more. We'll come back and we'll talk about it. Kyle, uh, before I get into a, a description of a cord of wood, did you say you use between five and six and a half? Did I get that right? Kyle, do you use between five and six and a half cords of wood? Is, did I get that right? Uh Vince, you were dead on the air to me just a little bit there. Did you say that I burned about five and a half, yeah, approximately last okay. year? Okay. All right, five and a half. Okay. So, class, here are the numbers. Uh, Rich Sheban burns about nine cords of wood. That's for heating and cooking, okay? Kyle, five and a half cords of wood. And at our farmhouse, we burn between five and seven. So the numbers aren't all that different, right? Well, <clears throat> let's talk about how big a cord of wood is. A cord of wood, if you were to stack it neatly, it measures four feet high by four feet wide by eight feet long. So four feet wide, I'm sorry, four feet high, four feet wide, and eight feet long. So the volume is 128 cubic feet. Now that's a full cord of wood. So the next question 
<clears throat> is how much does a cord of wood weigh? Well, if it's hardwood, it weighs more than two tons. A ton is 2,000 pounds. So we're looking at about 4,000 pounds. And I got to tell you, we have a 100 horsepower tractor. It's a big tractor. It weighs 12,000 pounds. It's not easy for that tractor to pick up a ton. It can't pick up two tons. You need a backhoe. Literally, you need a backhoe's front end bucket to pick up 4,000 pounds. And that's how we do it. We use a, a backhoe to pick them up and move them, these, cord, uh, these cords of wood. Um, we're able to buy, we were able to buy, we don't do it anymore, but we were able to buy what's called ricks of wood. Now, I don't know if the term is exactly right. What it is, when logs are cut into boards, they cut off the round part and make them square. And they trim as little as possible. So you get some bark and you get, uh, you know, the unwanted slabs of wood that are trimmings to make boards out of trees. Now, we could, we used to be able to buy them for $20. And that'd be maybe, oh, three feet by three feet by eight feet long. And they were heavy. But we'd have to cut them up with our chainsaw. Now, it's kind of a dangerous job. But, and it would eat chainsaw blades like crazy. Literally, what we would do is hook two chains to the front bucket of the backhoe. We would lift these lengths of wood in the air, and then we would use the chainsaw and just cut down, and the boards would just fall to the ground. And then we'd move them with the backhoe. But what I'm trying to get to is if a cord of wood, it's hard work. And you need some equipment um, if you're gonna if you're gonna uh, drag trees out of the woods. You might want to have a tractor to do that because trees are heavy. I mean, really heavy. And here's here's a, uh, let's see. I was gonna tell you. Okay, how many trees does it take to uh, make a cord of wood? Well, a tree's diameter is typically measured at your breast height, about four and a half feet from the ground. And that's called uh, diameter at breast height, D-B-H, D-B-H. So if trees are five inches D-B-H and they're harvested for firewood, it would require 46 to 55 trees to make one cord of firewood. That's a lot of trees. So what we do is we cut we cut up the dead ones. We pull them out of the woods with the tractors, and then we cut them up because we don't want to. We don't want to kill new trees, but or living trees. But what I'm saying is, it takes an enormous amount. So if you have a little pile in the back of your pickup truck, and you think that's going to get you through the winter, not even close. It won't even get you through half a week. Am I exaggerating, gentlemen, or not? No, and uh, I do things a little differently because I don't have a backhoe or a tractor, and I just buck everything in the woods. And I drive my UTV very close to the tree that I harvest. And uh, I just put in the bucks one at a time. And I drive off and I come back and do another load. And what I see, what I do is something a little different than most people because of my model of moderation and modification. I harvest firewood year round. Where I know some people who literally bust their back and get all their winter wood in three weeks. And to me, I, I just can't do that anymore. And it makes it, la it does, it's not fun anymore. I like to have it fun, so I break sure. it up. And I probably average, to be honest with you, 20. Now, it's going to be a little more this fall because we had such a dry fire season, and I didn't run the chainsaw mm -hmm. during the summer. But I, on average, run my chainsaw 20 minutes per week to get my nine cords. That's it, 20 minutes per week. That's nothing. Right. What can uh, can you share with us, Rich Sheben, what kind of a chainsaw you have and what size? And then, Kyle, same thing for you. Rich? I think I've got a steel 350, um, but I have three different saws. I have a small saw, a medium saw, and a large saw for bigger diameter trees. So um, one thing, if you're ever harvesting firewood, in the forest or on your land, and the tree is up, whether it be living or dead, 
I'll guarantee you one thing. It always looks smaller when it's on the stump compared to when it's on the ground. So you have to keep yeah. that in mind. And what I do right. is this is a really good hint for talking about thinking with foresight. When I do harvest a live tree because it has mistletoe or it's about ready to fall and it's leaning too much and it'll just fall over, create a, a, a ball root, um, what I'll do is I'll harvest my live trees during, like, the spring of the previous year or the summer and use the chainsaw to bring down the tree and bucket so that there's less wear and tear in my chainsaw with a live tree compared to a dead tree where the wood's harder and there's more wear and tear on the saw. So then I let right. the tree season on the ground all year, sometimes even over the winter, depending on when I harvest it, and I will harvest that tree, those bucks on the ground the next year or towards the end of the year and put it in my carport and be ready for uh, my wood stove, and I, I like to have my wood season a good year. I will not mm -hmm. burn anything unless it's at least six months on the ground and bucked. Vince? Yeah, and, and that's that's a really good point, and there are many reasons. One reason is that if you have green wood, meaning not seasoned, not dried out wood, you'll find that the the amount of wood the heat that you get out of the wood is way less than if the wood is dry. Because what you're doing is you're boiling water. You're boiling the moisture out of the wood. And it takes an enormous amount of energy to do that. So you're wasting a lot of the potential heat that you would have had if the wood were dry. Second point is that moisture goes up to the chimney and forms uh, creosote, which is really flammable. And you can make a jet engine out of your flu with creosote in there and air. Um, air, fire, and creosote will turn that flu or can turn that flu into a jet engine. You'll see flames come out at night you won't believe. Absolutely terrifying. And it will roar like a jet engine. And for those of you who have experienced that, it is terrifying. It is frightening because if you have a masonry chimney, a brick chimney, um, you're, you're, the, the thoughts that are going through your mind is this thing is going to fracture, crack, crumble, fall apart, and the house is going to burn down. Those are the thoughts that you have. Um, I've had those thoughts. And uh, what you do, and what I do, is I shut off the air as best I can to prevent that from happening. Now, the other thing you do is you clean out your chimneys, um, whether they're insulated, steel, stainless steel chimneys, or whatever you have, clean them out. And I bought a brush. Um, it's a... It's a round brush because we have a round uh, stainless steel insulated chimney outside. And uh, we drop the, the round brush from the top of the chimney. There's a rope and then, you know, when, the, when there's no fire. And then we pull this really heavy um, steel brush from the top down and it, it scrapes the creosote from the, the walls of the, of the chimney down. And then we collect that creosote in a five gallon bucket. Now, what do we do with that? Well, you can mix it with uh, petroleum like diesel fuel, and you can use it to soak your fence posts in, if they're wood, to prevent rot. And that would be called creosote. And they used to sell that stuff. So, yeah, you can use it for that. It's probably not recommended by the EPA, but the railroad uses it, and they haven't found anything better. Kyle, what kind of a chainsaw do you have? I have uh, actually six chainsaws. I have two uh, 034 uh, steel chainsaws. Um, I ha I used to run Husqvarna's, but I just kept having more and more trouble with them, and so I went to steel only. Uh, I did find uh, again, this is hilarious. I found a Poulin Pro uh, medium sized chainsaw at a garage sale about oh four years ago, and mm -hmm. the guy couldn't get it started. Uh, mm -hmm. Five bucks. Uh, mm -hmm. True story. I took it home, uh, cleaned it up sprayed a little stuff in the carburetor, cleaned that up, and uh, put gas in it and uh, cleaned the plug, and it fired right off. And I have been using that saw for at least the last four or five years almost exclusively. It's a real uh, medium-weight uh, saw, and I also mm -hmm. have a little uh, small uh, steel 
uh, 125, I think it's called, but I, it's just a, a great little saw for the little things, you know. It'll cut down trees that are eight inches in diameter at the base, you know, uh, just mm-hmm. fine. Now, it's not as fast as my 36s, but, you know, crying out loud, there's a big difference there when you're dealing with a 20-pound saw compared to a, you know, 7-pound saw. Yes, yeah. Well, if, if the class wanted to know what we have, uh, my, my old saw is McCulloch, and they don't make them anymore. They went out of business. And it's a, a big bear. It's a pretty heavy saw. Uh, our son uses a Husqvarna Rancher. It's a 460 model. It's about 60 cc's. And then um, Mrs. Finelli likes our little home light that we have. It's a, oh, it's probably from the 1980s. And it's a smaller saw. And it's great for limbing and trimming. So that's what we have. A McCulloch, a home light, a Husqvarna. So we've been talking about wood and uh, class. I can tell you that the lighter the wood is in weight, assuming it's dry, okay? assuming it is not uh, just been alive and cut, assuming the wood has been dried out, the lighter it is, the less, generally the less amount of heat you're going to get from it. So pine will give you way less heat than let's say, hickory or oak, okay? So keep that in mind. The heavier the log is, the more heat you're going to get out of it. Kyle and, and Rich, I've got questions for you. Kyle, um, please uh, please let us know your thoughts first, and then I'll chime in. When when you start a fire in a, in a wood stove, how do you do that? Would you share your method, please? Well, uh, yeah, the old Indian trick, actually. Uh, I use... Uh, a bunch of kindling and uh, scrap newspaper. <laughs> I'm sorry, but it's just we uh, we we have sure. uh, when we split wood. There's all kinds of little shavings all over the ground. When you're splitting up wood, like Rich is saying with your splitter, there'll be chunks and little pieces of slivers and stuff. And we gather all that stuff up, and I've got about five or six totes full of that stuff. And then so I bring it in in five gallon buckets. Um, uh, when I need it, because uh, it's covered, and um, then I put that. I'll put some paper in there, put some slivers of this wood there, and then a couple of real dry, smaller logs uh, on top of it, and uh, light torch it off. Leave the uh, door cracked just a little bit to get a good draft going, and it'll fire right off. Uh, then mm-hmm. before the end of the show, I want to let Rich finish up here, and I'll get off the air. I didn't mean to come on and talk so long, but. If people really, if we would implement the things that Rich has put in his book, uh, I guarantee you this country would change in a matter of months. Um, they, I cannot recommend it enough. I have it. I've read it. Uh, it is an excellent book. And I'm sorry, Rich, I did not mean to take up so much time here. I just I hadn't. No, Kyle, you know. I love having you on, buddy. I love having you on. And um, you're, you're doing exactly what most people need to do. You articulate it. Uh, wonderfully, and if more people start thinking about buying land and gardening, animals, solar recreation, get away from this cookie cutter, follower, politically correct mentality, and control their own destiny, I think uh, we need more spokespeople like you to do what you're doing. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Well, Agreed. I appreciate your book, and I thank you, Vince. I'll hang up and let you and Rich finish it up. Thanks so much, Kyle. See you, Kyle. And w- one comment about uh, kind of what Kyle said. We we don't just read about it and talk about it. This is the way we live, literally. This is the way we live. And I wanted to tell you, class, that if you decide to get a farm, well, those chainsaws are tax deductions. They really are, or they can be. Um, Rich, how do you start a fire? Well, very similar to what... Kyle does, except we save all of our mail, all of our junk mail, everything that comes in gets thrown mm-hmm. in the box, and we mm-hmm. not only harvest kindling from splitting wood like Kyle said with a wood splitter, but in one, we, we harvest a lot of boxes, okay, and we'll bring home a box from town, and in probably 15 minutes, we can fill up a box full of kindling because we live in the forest. I mean, it's not a hardship mm-hmm. to pick up kindling. So we keep that dry under a roof, and between our uh, shavings from splitting, the kindling we harvest, and the mail that we don't throw away, and anything that's paper 
or can be burned is our fire starter. Now, you were talking about your flu and creosote buildup. One important thing that you uh, did not mention, I'm going to touch on that, is when you start a fire, folks, right off the bat, start it real hot. Get it going real hot. Not where the stove is glowing all over, but the hotter you get that stove, the more that creosote gets burned when you start your fire early. Also, it has the same functionality right before you end your fire for the day. Get that stove real hot, burns that creosote out, and it really makes a difference, Ben. Yeah, probably the reason why I didn't mention it is we hardly ever start fires. Uh, ours, ours, our fires run for years, uh, literally. Uh, we don't want to get uh, put them out because uh, it takes uh, some effort to get them going again. But, yeah, we use kindling. Uh, first, we put newspaper uh, flyers that come in and mail and put them on the bottom, crumple, up, crumple them up, lots of air, small kindling. We might even want to pour some used kitchen oil on the on that uh, mass and then light it with a match. And then progressively larger and larger pieces of wood. That's how we do it. Rich, thanks so much for being with us.